All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good morning, everybody. My name is Tim Kutz with Fairfax County, and I want to welcome you to this meeting to discuss the draft plan amendment for the McLean Community Business Center. Before we begin, I'd like to review some meeting guidelines so that everybody can participate and get the most out of this session. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and it will be uploaded on YouTube and shared on the project website. We will answer as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. You may submit questions or comments into the Q&A box, which is located at the lower right hand of your screen at any time. If you do not see the Q&A box, you may have to click on the icon with three dots. It's on the lower right corner of your screen. When typing a question, please be sure to direct it to all panelists. And for people calling into the meeting, you can hit star three to raise your hand and ask a question. I'll call your name during the Q&A portion of the meeting and unmute your microphone, at which point you can ask your question and hit star three again to lower your hand. I'll review these instructions again at the conclusion of the presentation. Questions and comments will be recorded and they'll be made part of the record for study and placed on the project website. There's also a chat feature. It's enabled for participants requiring technical support only. We ask that you do not use the chat feature to comment or ask questions regarding the study. Again, instead, just use the Q&A feature to submit questions or make comments in that regard. We also encourage you to submit written comments after the conclusion of today's meeting. An email address will be provided at the end of the presentation for that. Okay, I would now like to welcome Drainsville District Supervisor John Faust to provide some remarks. Supervisor Faust. Good morning and thank you, uh, Tim, and thank you uh, everyone for joining us this morning. Uh, at our last community-wide meeting, uh, it was held on November 7th, and there the county presented the recommendations of the uh, Community Business Center Task Force for downtown McLean. Based on feedback from that meeting, staff has refined the draft and will prepare their uh, uh, will share their proposed changes today. After staff's presentation, we'll open up the meeting for comments and questions. So staff has a, a detailed presentation and, and uh, I think it's an excellent presentation. I look forward to it, but we need some background before we, uh, for those who may be joining us for the first time. I know there seems to be, uh, uh, there seem to be people in the community who are uh, focusing on this now for the first time, and that's perfectly typical and understandable, but uh, it requires a little bit of uh, background uh, to, to uh, before we turn it over to staff to tell us where we're at. I need to talk to about how we got here. So uh, in 2018, the county hired a consultant to lead a series of workshops to develop a, a shared vision uh, for the future of McLean. Uh, several common themes emerged from that uh, uh, those meetings, which were, by the way, attended by hundreds of McLean residents. Uh, the need for a revitalized McLean and support for setting aside a portion of downtown McLean for a more pedestrian friendly development. Uh, another point that was agreed to was uh, protecting the neighborhoods that border the CDC was a priority and residents provided feedback on building heights they felt were appropriate. Uh, there was a desire for a gathering place where residents could meet up with friends or bring guests, and the importance of retaining the community serving retail and business function in downtown uh, was stressed. I would say that, like you might expect, there was not unanimous agreement, but in my experience in this business, it was as close as you can get. Uh, there was an amazing amount of agreement amongst those who participated and what we really need to do to make McLean uh, uh, work for everybody. So the consultant also conducted a, a market analysis and found significant demand for residential development and you know, one or two possibly, possibly small hotels, something similar to what Staybridge has now. Uh, this is over a 10 year horizon uh, visioning statement. We use the 10 year horizon, which is typical. Uh, they did not see much demand for new office buildings. Uh, they believe that the office buildings that we have will basically 
uh, be replaced in kind. Uh, they, uh, they don't see McLean becoming a, a significant uh, office center. Uh, they also determined that we have sufficient retail square footage, but that some of it was in locations or in a form that uh, no longer was desired by retailers. So the consultant presented the vision plan at a December 2018 community meeting. Their recommendations took market demand into account and provided sufficient incentive for properties to redevelop in select areas. Again, it was very well received by the community members who participated. Their proposal included three zones, a center zone, which was focused on the intersection of Beverly and Elm Streets, where pedestrian oriented style development would be located. Buildings in this zone would be no taller than seven stories and have generous sidewalks, streets, trees, and other amenities. Surrounding the center zone, there is a general zone around the core, which would be a moderate intensity and consistent with the suburban style development we have in that area today. And then finally, the, uh, the edge zone, which is surrounds the general zone and is a buffer uh, between the general zone and the um, uh, existing neighborhoods, uh, properties along this edge zone would see no change from what they are planned uh, for today. So I will tell you, after listening to local residents uh, and participating myself in the discussions for many years about what downtown McLean should be, what we wanted it to be as a community, I believe the vision uh, that the community defined has really has something for everyone. You know, not everybody agrees. Uh, never does everyone agree, uh, in my experience, on, on, on these types of things. But the unique thing about this vision statement is that we have, again, something for everyone. The center zone is going to accommodate those who want uh, uh, a more of a pedestrian friendly, a little more vibrant place where we can create a sense of community in McLean that's difficult to uh, uh, accommodate today. Uh, at the same time, the edge zone, you know, protects the surrounding neighborhoods, but also uh, continues to allow for that automobile friendly convenience, the, uh, the, the parking lots, uh, the, the convenience of being able to park your car and walk in and uh, to a, uh, a grocery store or a um, pharmacy or whatever your needs are. Uh, so, you know, it, it, again, something for everyone. Because of the market demand, the consultant determined that the community could reasonably expect a minimum of a two third acre plaza as part of a development project in the center zone. This became a key for everyone uh, focusing on that plaza as a, a set, creating the sense of place for downtown McLean. Uh, in order to achieve that, the, the consultant recommended for this one development a uh, bonus dense uh, height density up to 10 stories. Uh, so that's a height similar to but slightly taller than the McLean House and the Ashby. Everything else proposed in this. Uh, vision statement and comprehensive plan would be shorter than those existing buildings. Uh, the visioning effort has not uh, was not designed to draft detailed language for a comprehensive plan amendment. Therefore, uh, concurrent with the workshop, uh, the visioning workshops, we formed a task force of stakeholders to uh, translate the vision plan into a set of recommendations uh, for amending the comprehensive plan for McLean. That task force group mostly included uh, your neighbors, McLean residents. There were 20 of the members. Uh, there were McLean residents who live in and around McLean. Most of the members were selected by organizations made up of McLean residents and led by McLean residents. Uh, organizations that were asked to suggest uh, members for the task force included the McLean Citizens Association, the McLean Planning Committee, McLean Revitalization Corporation, the McLean Chamber of Commerce, and the McLean Project for the Arts. 
There are also some members of neighboring HOAs, parents of McLean area students, and other stakeholders who uh, were asked to participate. The group met publicly, publicly nearly every month for two and a half years for a total of 29 meetings. In addition to the visions plan, the task force considered nominations by property owners and a planning horizon for 20 years instead of 10 analyzed by a consultant. That is not at all a typical uh, of a, a comprehensive planning effort to go out 20 years. So the group debated about levels of development, where it should be located and what form it should take. They also spent considerable time analyzing the impacts of developments and mitigation measures related to public facilities, such as schools, parks, and roads. All of their meetings, all of their meetings were open to the public and non-task force members were given the opportunity to contribute to the discussions. Any suggestion that the process was not open, transparent, and fair is unjust to the task force members who labored through a totally transparent process for over two years. Not everyone will agree with the final product. That is evidenced by the uh, by some of the communications in the community as we uh, talk today. But everyone had a chance to influence that final product. So the task force presented their recommendations, which track closely to the vision plan at a virtual public meeting in December 2020. The three zone concept, center zone, general zone, edge zone, retained in the comprehensive plan. The number of stories of the zones contemplated in the vision plan is still the same. And the plaza remains the centerpiece of the plan. The task force did deviate the vision plan with respect to the plaza uh, a recommendation uh, which I did not find acceptable, and I'll touch on that uh, shortly. So after the task force concluded its work, the county and I received additional feedback from residents and shareholder groups. Many good questions and comments were submitted about the plan, and I've worked with staff to clarify and address various issues. Staff will go into detail about the changes, but I'd like to touch on a few. First is the size of the plaza. Task force recommended allowing a smaller plaza if a developer proposed a project that was smaller than the six acres contemplated in the vision plan. County staff did not agree with the task force recommendation, and I agree with staff that it's important we retain language in the plan for at least a two third acre park. As a result of concerns raised about schools, staff has strengthened plan language to assure the capacity keeps pace with development. There is also now a requirement that a capacity assessment be undertaken by the county in collaboration with FCPS when 50% of the residential development potential of the CDC is reached. We've also received feedback that the environmental concerns needed more prominence in the, in the plan. I totally agree with that recommendation. The draft plan will be amended to strengthen the requirements for stormwater management in McLean and the need for green infrastructure. Staff is working on language that treats tree canopy and vegetation as a component of the natural ecology in downtown as opposed to being treated solely as a matter of landscaping or aesthetics. So finally, there have been many requests for clarification on the allowed building heights being proposed in each of those zones. Both the task force and staff recommended using the number of stories as a measure of height. And I know this is a little wonky and I apologize. Staff, uh, and the draft plan includes a description of typical floor to floor heights based on the development type. I do not fully agree with staff on this issue. I've asked staff to incorporate a maximum height in feet for each of the zones in the plan and that the maximum height be inclusive of the bonus density associated with affordable housing units. So that's a big change, but it's, it's difficult to explain. Uh, so these and other changes will be reflected in staff's recommendations that will be released in the next two weeks or so 
and in advance of the public hearing. Planning Commission hearing will be April 28th. Board of Supervisors uh, uh, hearing on the comprehensive plan will be May 18th. As always, they are totally open, uh, public, transparent. You're encouraged to participate, and we'll certainly look forward to hearing from you between now and then. Uh, I want to thank county staff and the hundreds, literally hundreds of McLean residents who took time to participate in the uh, important visioning process and in the comprehensive planning process. I especially want to thank the task force members. You all know that McLean has a history of active and constructive participation by community members in making decisions that affect our community. And uh, we had 20, 20 volunteers serve for two and a half years. Uh, most of the task force members were selected, as I said earlier, by community organizations that have been representing the interests of McLean residents for over for many years. And you know with respect to the McLean Citizens Association for over 100 years. This has been a great process. And in my opinion, the process is that the participants have achieved an excellent product, but nothing is perfect. And we look forward to the ongoing discussion of how this product can be improved. So thank you again. Thank you for your participation. I'm gonna turn it over to Jennifer Garcia in the planning uh, Department of Planning and Development for uh, an update and I believe a PowerPoint presentation. And then we'll be anxious to continue the, the, uh, the discussion with you uh, and your questions and comments. So thank you very, very much. I really appreciate your participation. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jennifer Garcia with Thank you so much, Supervisor Faust, for that really excellent overview. And it really sets the stage quite well for how we envision this presentation going this morning. So the first part of the presentation is, is going to primarily focus on those main areas in which staff is proposing modifications to the draft recommendations. And so those topics, as Supervisor Faust just mentioned, include building height, land unit G2, which is the land unit that's right next to Franklin Sherman Elementary School, and the environment and public schools. Following that, we're going to provide an overview of the other components of the draft plan for those of you that may not be as familiar with them. Um, and these are the components that don't have new recommendations since that December draft that's posted onto our website. So by way of some background, um, the plan amendment was authorized, um, as the supervisor mentioned, on um, April of 2018, and it directed staff to consider revisions to the CBC's comprehensive plan recommendations. Um, the goal of the study um, is to update those recommendations, which have not been evaluated and updated as a whole in over 20 years. And so relatively recently, there had been a, some site-specific updates to the plan, um, and there was a recognition by the county and by the community that a comprehensive review of the plan would provide a greater opportunity to review the plan's ability to incentivize redevelopment opportunities and offer amenities to the community. Um, so a task force was comprised of residents representing neighborhood and community organizations, landowners, and business associations, and they began meeting in May of 2018 and met all the way through December of 2020. So before we get into the specifics of the McLean um, comprehensive planning effort, it's helpful to understand um, what is the county's comprehensive plan and its relationship to the zoning ordinance. So the comprehensive plan is a guide that's used by the community, staff, and the county leaders to make decisions about land use within the county. It contains rec recommendations. It's not regulatory. However, it's where the community's future priorities, visions, and goals for land use are documented. The comprehensive plan may include conditions under, uh, for which development options can occur. Um, some of you may also be familiar with the zoning ordinance and so know that it's tied to land use. So each parcel of land belongs to a zoning district. And these districts have various requirements related to things like permitted land uses, setbacks from property lines, maximum heights of structures, and the amount of open space that should be provided. For the McLean CBC, if a plan amendment is adopted, when a property owner wants to redevelop their land to be consistent with the vision of the CBC, the land will need to be rezoned first. That means a rezoning application would be filed with the county 
and that's a process that includes additional public review. And re rezoning applications are evaluated for consistency with the comprehensive plan. The study we're here to discuss today contemplates updates to the comprehensive plan and it's not proposing any changes to the zoning ordinance and does not involve a rezoning review of any piece of property within the CBC. So I wanted to, to mention a, an overview, uh, an overall timeline of the study. So again, the study was authorized in April um, of 2018 with the task force convened by Supervisor Faust to work with county staff and they met regularly um, through from May 2018 through December of 2020. And from June to December of 2018, a visioning process was conducted that many of you all probably participated in. And that comprised of a series was comprised of a series of community workshops that was conducted in partnership between a consultant, Street Sense, and the county. So using community feedback from the workshops, along with the market assessment of the estimated 10-year demand for different uses, the consultant created a vision plan for the CBC. That vision plan was the basis from which the task force, the community, and the county considered changes to the existing comprehensive plan recommendations. The county hosted a virtual open house on November 7th of last year. We've also had many conversations with residents and community groups since then. So today we're here to review proposed updates to the draft as a result of these additional conversations and the feedback the county has received. In approximately two weeks, a revised draft will be available for review. We welcome additional feedback before finalizing the staff recommendation. Public hearings are scheduled for uh, April 28th before the Planning Commission and May 18th before the Board of Supervisors. So now let's get into those proposed changes and I'll provide some background as well um, as it's relevant. So starting with the sort of takeaways, the key takeaways of this plan. So there are five of them that I want to review. The first is that the proposed plan focuses redevelopment in the center of the CBC while protecting existing neighborhoods that surround it. It introduces new opportunities for residential use that will help to incentivize redevelopment and provide for new amenities. Third, it sets the framework for a signature redevelopment and a public park in central downtown McLean and includes guidance for creating places that are engaging for pedestrians as a way to bring about revitalization and a pedestrian-oriented environment. Um, it adds flexibility by recommending a form-based approach for the center of the CBC. Maximum building heights and overall development cap and design are used to guide the review of development proposals. And I think I may have skipped over the very important goal of creating places for people. And again, that relates to this pedestrian-oriented environment and the design guidelines. So next, uh, let's talk about this zones concept. So the draft plan includes three zones. So the gray that you see on here is the center zone. Within that center zone, that gray area, you'll see this hatched area, which is the bonus height area that I'll get into as well. Surrounding the center zone is this pinkish red area, that's the general zone. And then outside of that in the yellow is the edge zone. Uh, the zones concept is one that was brought forth from the vision plan. Um, a difference being that there is added flexibility for considering redevelopment in both the center and general zones. The edge would remain as planned to ensure a transition area to the adjacent neighborhoods. So another way to really think of this is in terms of tiers. So you have the center of downtown, where the plan envisions mixed use development with the new signature public park, then transitioning down in building height and scale with the edge remaining as currently planned today. Going back to this bonus height area, again, it's that cross touch area within the gray. Additional height is recommended for one project up to six acres to incentivize the creation of a central gathering place for the community. The next couple of slides are gonna get into the character of, this, of each zone. So starting with center zone, that's envisioned to be the heart of downtown McLean. A mix of uses is recommended with heights up to seven stories but no more than 92 feet. So the inclusion of the measurement in feet is new, but the number of stories is the same as previous draft. Buildings are recommended to be, close, recommended to be lo located close to the sidewalk and lined with active ground floor uses. 
streetscapes that include trees, seating, high quality sidewalks and bike facilities are, are also very important in creating this welcoming environment and they're a major feature of this proposed plan. Underground or structured parking is encouraged with redevelopment. However, um, parking for retail is very important and limited surface parking in front of buildings may be appropriate as well as on street parking. As informed by the vision plan, a consolidation up to six acres may be appropriate for additional height with the provision of a high quality public open space, a priority that was clearly expressed during the community workshops. The proposed plan recommends up to 10 stories for this area um, at a maximum of 128 feet. Next for the public open space. So again, we wanted to, to kind of focus in a little bit on this key desired outcome, which is the signature urban park space in the center zone. And it's also a really important feature of the, the CBC wide parks concept. The signature urban park could be located anywhere within this green hatched area, <clears throat> excuse me, on the map. The park is recommended to be accessible to the public and provide opportunities for both passive and active uses. The plan also recommends a network of well distributed smaller urban park spaces connected by pedestrian and bicycle facilities. Next, we'll move um, outward to, oh, I'm sorry, public open space, yes. So the images that were selected by the community during the visioning process show preference, preferences for the types of public open space. Common themes among these images are plazas, hardscape elements and places to gather. Um, the specific designs of these spaces would be considered um, at the time of, of re a rezoning application is, is filed. All right, now let's move on to general zone. Very good. Um, so the general zone is planned for as a transition from the center to the, to the edge. Redevelopment um, in the general zone is envisioned as low to mid-rise mixed use with building heights up to five stories or maximum of 60 feet. Again, uh, the inclusion of a maximum in feet is new, but the number of stories is the same as the previous draft. Active ground floor uses are appropriate for new development in the general zone. Um, and the general zone is where typical neighbor, neighborhood serving retail uses with convenient parking could be located. So this photograph and rendering are examples of the type of development um, that are possible under the, the new plan in the general zone, such as neighborhood serving, retail, and residential uses. Redevelopment under the new plan provides opportunities for public benefits. Um, oh, next, next slide, please. Thanks so much. Redevelopment under the new plan provides opportunities for public benefits, such as underground and utilities, enhanced streetscapes like you see here, and additional open space. We'll get into more details um, on streetscapes later on in the presentation, but we want to, to show you some of those features um, at this point in the presentation. So lastly, for the edge zone, the edge zone is envisioned to remain currently as planned and is consistent, um, and that's consistent with the December draft. The edge zone primarily reflects existing development and will provide a buffer between the general zone and the surrounding residential neighborhoods. It's primarily comprised of townhomes and single family detached residential uses with some community serving retail, commercial and institutional uses, um, including the Franklin Sherman Elementary School. So I touched on building height maximums in feet and I wanted to go through that again, since that is a, um, a change from, from previous drafts. So based on feedback about building heights, uh, staff is proposing to keep the number of maximum stories, but also specify a maximum height in feet for center and general zones. And this again was um, a request by community groups and um, to provide some more certainty. So the maximum heights are proposed to be 68 feet in the general zone and 92 feet in the center zone with the exception of the smaller bonus height area. In that bonus height area, a plan recommends a height up to 128 feet for a single project if a minimum two third acre park is provided. To provide additional certainty, another new change is that the maximum heights would be inclusive 
of any bonus intensity associated with providing affordable or workforce housing. So uh, going back to the bonus height area, the previous uh, draft plan included a recommendation. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, so, all right, let's talk about land unit G2. And so in response to concerns about potential building height impacts to Frank on Franklin Sherman Elementary School. Um, so staff recommends keeping uh, this G2, uh, this land area in the general zone, but is also considering the idea of limiting height to a development to, of a maximum of 40 feet on the area shaded in blue. And that's the same as the maximum building height allowed today for buy rate development under current C2 and C8 commercial zoning districts. So next, moving on to the environment, um, we've received a lot of comments and, and feedback regarding the environmental guidance in the draft plan. In response to these comments, um, planning principles are being added regarding the environment. There will be more of an emphasis on the need for green infrastructure, as well as language that recognizes tree canopy and vegetation should be considered more broadly as a component of entire ecological landscape for the CBC. The first principle focuses on sustainable communities and the protection and enhancement of the built environment and ecological resources. The second calls for a connected network of green spaces and green corridors. It recognizes that each site has a role to play in the creation of a larger ecologically functional landscape. So drilling down a bit into the environmental section, it contains primarily three components. The first, is ecological resources. So the plan will call for the reintroduction of trees and other plantings and incorporates natural landscaping principles to ensure that plantings are viable. Second, with regard to stormwater management, the staff acknowledges this is very important to the community since McLean has experienced downstream flooding and in particular attention needs to be paid to mitigate its impacts. Um, re recommended stormwater quality controls address both uh, managing quantity and quality. Third, for forestry, the plan recognizes trees for their economic and environmental benefits and also addresses the ability for trees and other plantings to survive in, an, um, in this environment. And as a final note, the green building and noise guidance in the draft plan calls for consistency with the pre existing policy plan recommendations. Um, community feedback included concerns about the need to ensure that development will keep pace with public school capacity. As Supervisor Faust mentioned um, earlier in his remarks, a new proposed recommendation is for the county and public schools to conduct an assessment when approximately 50% of the center and general zone residential development potential is approved or constructed. The assessment would evaluate the effectiveness and sufficiency of school mitigation measures. It would compare estimated student yield at the time an application was reviewed with the most current student yield, any school mitigation measures that were provided with each approved application, and potential solutions that Fairfax County Public Schools have identified as appropriate. So now I'm going to transition to an overview of the other components of the draft that do not have new recommendations since the December version. The center and general zones, the, the gray and the pink areas, have a recommended form-based approach with the goal of providing flexibility to respond to the market rather than prescribing specific uses to specific properties. The form-based approach also introduces the ability to include residential uses within those two zones, which is not currently in the plan except for areas that are already developed, excuse me, already developed or approved for residential uses. Components of the form-based plan are a total development cap or development potential that's split into two categories, residential and non-residential. We'll get into the specific numbers in the following slides. 
um, and the review of development applications will be guided by building height maximums and design guidance that provides recommendations for elements including site design and streetscapes. So let's talk about C the CBCY development potential. So this compares the adopted comprehensive plan potential on the left with the draft proposed comprehensive plan potential um, split by residential units and non-residential square feet. And we thought it would be good to drill down more on the residential side since that's where there's the most proposed change compared to the adopted plan, which you'll see on the next slide. So the, so the um, adopted comprehensive plan recommends 2,175 residential units. The proposed plan, which recommends 3,850 units for a 20 plus year horizon, um, accounts for the current plan's unbuilt potential as well as a shorter term 10 year market assessment um, for the residential component. The task force and staff reviewed submissions and additional development potential beyond 10 years. A new recommendation, so that's where, where you get the difference in the proposed plan. There's also a new recommendation that proposes that the development potential is inclusive of any bonus intensity associated with providing affordable and workforce housing. So earlier on, um, you mentioned that one of the components of the form-based plan um, includes design as well as the development cap and the height. And so we wanted to, to spend some more time on, on streetscape designs. And so I'd like to introduce Zach Powell who will provide some of those additional details. Hello, I'm Zach Powell. Um, I'm going to explain a little bit more about streetscape in the current uh, um, proposed comp uh, plan amendment. Uh, streetscape is uh, made up of visual elements of a street, including the road, adjoining buildings, street furniture, trees, and open spaces uh, that combine to form a street's character. It provides space for building zones where outdoor cafes and markets can be held, as well as amenities to serve uh, vehicles, pedestrians, and bicyclists. A cross section, which we'll see a couple of these coming up here, uh, includes the components of the street and its dimensions. Um, a cross section picks how streets should be designed in order to accommodate all the intended travel modes, including vehicles, transit, pedestrians, and bicyclists. Providing for all these travel modes will improve connectivity between neighborhoods, businesses throughout the CBC. And these improvements can be done either through uh, uh, redevelopment or public uh, capital improvement projects. plan where there are two different avenue types and two different local street types and the avenue and the local street types amongst, amongst themselves that really change that much uh, the details but um, the avenue type one as you can see is Old Dominion avenue type two is Chain Bridge and the uh, local street type one would be roads like uh, Beverly and Elm and local street type two would be all the other roads within the CBC that are not identified as the other ones. Okay. okay, so for example, here's a proposed avenue. This here is actually the avenue type one example, which would be Old Dominion. And in this uh, example, uh, it would have a, the current proposed avenue type one cross section is comprised of four lanes of vehicular travel lanes from Dolly Madison to Corner Lane transitioning the two lanes of the southeastern C. Uh, there are no other additional travel lanes recommended for this cross section. Uh, within this cross section, there are there's a landscape panel, a building zone that allows people to uh, uh, intermix alongside the bike and uh, shared use pathway for outdoor uh, cafe uses and other public gathering spaces. And uh, it also allows for people to, and bicyclists to share this space where if there's more bicyclists one day, the pedestrians could share that space with the bicyclists or vice versa. 
if there's a street event and there's more pedestrians on the street. So that's your avenue type one for an example. Thank you very much, Zach. So another really important component of, um, of the studies, of our planning studies, is an assessment of public facilities. Um, and if needed, uh, mitigation strategies are included in the draft plan. Schools, parks, libraries, police, fire, fire and rescue, wastewater management, Fairfax water have capacity to meet the proposed plan potential in the CDC. And these agencies will monitor impacts as development applications come in. Next, uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time on the transportation recommendations. So I'd like to bring forward um, Zach Fomel, who's going to cover this topic. Thanks very much, Zach. Transportation is an important part of a comprehensive plan. Uh, it describes a vision of how the transportation network should function, uh, which means of travel should be prioritized where, and specific infrastructure improvements to make it happen. Uh, the draft plan does all three of those things and the resulting transportation network has been analyzed and can accommodate the changes in transportation demand related to the proposed land uses. Next slide, please. Uh, before we get into the transportation analysis, uh, this is a vision level description of what we think the draft plan would achieve in terms of transportation. So with several road improvements, acceptable vehicle traffic would be maintained. Uh, for bus service, no changes are proposed, uh, and that's typical for plan amendments. The addition, uh, the improvement and addition of new sidewalks and trails would create more comfortable and complete bicycle and pedestrian networks. But it's important to remember that implementation of transportation improvements would happen gradually through redevelopment and capital projects, not all at once. Our planners used a travel demand model to forecast future changes in traffic, both related to McLean and those related to regional traffic patterns. Uh, the traffic forecasts were then fed into a traffic model that estimates delay. Uh, and this map shows that output. Um, basically the rough amount of time that drivers are forecast to be waiting at intersections during rush hour. Uh, very low delay intersections are shown in green, planned stop con controlled intersections as squares, and signalized intersections are shown as circles. And this graphic was submitted to the Virginia Department of Transportation as part of our transportation impact analysis report, which was approved uh, last summer. And Basically, what it shows is that intersections under the draft plan should continue to operate at an acceptable level, comparable to future modeled conditions under the current comprehensive plan. Next slide, please. Um, several road improvements are recommended in the draft plan to achieve those operations. Uh, a good example of that is the cul-de-sac at Elm Street. Uh, which should improve both operations and safety compared to the existing five-way intersection. Uh, there are some other more detailed recommendations that were included in the transportation impact analysis, but not in the plan itself um, because they're just too detailed, uh, like adding three new traffic signals at existing intersections to reduce delay. Uh, these improvements would be built over time and as needed. Uh, most likely through redevelopment. Next slide, please. Um, four bus routes currently serve the McLean CBC, including Fairfax Connector routes 721 and 722, and that's Fairfax County's transit service, and the Washington Metropolitan 
Area Transit Authority or WMATA routes uh, 23A and 23T, that's our regional transit agency. Uh, and those routes connect the CBC to the McLean Metro Station and other destinations in Northern Virginia. Uh, please note that WMATA suspended their Route 15K last summer, uh, but the connector has proposed a new route, uh, 715, to replace it. Uh, that connector planning effort is totally independent from the McLean CBC study, but you can follow the URL uh, shown on the slide to give feedback on that route plan. Um, so no changes to transit facilities or service are proposed as part of this plan amendment, uh, but connector route planning is evaluated continuously based on ridership and changes in land use. Um, the draft plan transportation map also recommends improvements for pedestrians and cyclists, including wider sidewalks, walkable streetscapes, and new trails, especially on Old Dominion, Chain Bridge, Beverly, and Elm, which got really the most, um, the, the closest look here, but also on other local streets. Um, these changes would make the active transportation network in McLean both more connected and more comfortable for users. Again, this vision won't be, would not be realized overnight, but future development and transportation capital projects will be reviewed closely for consistency with the plan vision. Thank you, Zach. Um, so this, this is gonna wrap up our staff presentation. I encourage all of you to please visit the study website. Uh, the URL, URL is shown here. On it, you'll find information, including previous uh, task force meeting videos, past presentation slides, as well as a document that has responses to questions we received at the November 7th open house. So right now there is that December 9th, 2020 draft plan text, but in approximately two weeks, you can look forward to a revised draft that incorporates uh, what we've discussed today. And we invite you to set, send us comments or questions on it or anything else um, at this email address, which is dpzmcleancbc at fairfaxcounty.gov. And again, just wanted to uh, remind folks of the currently scheduled public hearing dates which are uh, April 28th before the Planning Commission and May 18th before the Board of Supervisors. Um, these are public meetings with the opportunity to provide public testimony or also submit written comments. You can certainly find more information about hearings on the, the county's websites. Thank you so much for your time. All right, thank you, Jen. Uh, now we'd like to open the meeting up for questions. As a reminder, please use the Q&A function, which is on the right side of your screen, to type your question for the moderator to read out loud. If you do not see the Q&A box, you may have to click on the icon with the three dots, also located on the lower right corner of your screen. When typing a question, please be sure to direct it to all panelists. For people who are calling into the meeting, you can hit star three, which will raise your hand, and then you can ask a question. I'll call your name and unmute your microphone, at which point you can speak and then hit star three again to lower your hand. Again, please do not use the chat feature to comment or ask questions. This is only intended for technical support. As a final note, please keep in mind that we have many people attending today's community meeting and we would like to hear from as many of you as time allows. So with that in mind, please be respectful of others when asking your questions. Try to limit speaking time to about one or two minutes. And of course, if time runs out, any questions that have not been addressed will be saved as part of the record and responses to all questions will be posted online. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with the written questions first because we have quite a few of them already. The first one comes from Heidi who asks, who participated in the market analysis? You need to see the demographics of this study. Hi, uh, this, I'm Leanna O'Donnell with the Planning Division, the Department of Planning and Development. Uh, we worked with a consultant with Street Sense um, to develop the vision plan with the community. And as part of that work, uh, Street Sense provided us with a 10 year market assessment. And we have the information 
um, summary information from that work um, included with the vision plan work online. Um, so I, I hope that's helpful. <laughs> it was provided to us by a consultant, the, the 10 year market information. Thank you, Lana. Uh, next question comes from Natalia. She says last year, um, the pandemic changed a lot. So many researchers in the US are speaking. It is a new kind of business environment. Uh, no need for office space anymore. Did you make changes to the plan according to this knowledge? Hi, uh, the development potential, um, the, the market assessment that was done um, also just indicated that the McLean CBC would, would not need um, a significant amount of new office. We haven't reevaluated the numbers given the, the recent pandemic, but you will see in the total development potential that's recommended for the CBC, the amount of Non-residential square footage has decreased a little bit uh, to reflect to reflect that market assessment as well. So the plan does recognize um, that that the demand really is focused on other uses such as residential. Thank you, Leanna. Now we have a question about schools. This comes from Kazi. I appreciate Mr. Faust referring uh, to the plan to increase capacity in schools. Can you please provide additional details on which zone schools will be impacted by the high density residential units? And what is the plan to maintain capacity in all impacted schools? I have, we have, um, we have um, staff from Fairfax County Public Schools on the line, but I, I also just wanted to note first that um, as part of our analysis, we do receive um, receive analysis from schools where they identify the, the schools that are zoned um, to the area and then um, and then provide information on tracking uh, tracking student um, student enrollment and and make projections looking forward um, based on those assessments and um, Pranita, I don't know if you want to provide a little bit more information on that um, in terms of the review that occurs um, as development applications come in as well in your your programming. Mm -hmm. Hi, this is Pranita. So, um, like Liana mentioned, yeah, um, schools does provide an analysis memo. So, um, part of that memo is the schools. Uh, we look at the schools that are serving um, the area. Um, so, we look at it um, holistically. We don't look at it in just specific residential densities. We look at the entire CBC and all of the schools that would be serving the entire CBC. Um, so, the memo includes what the membership at those schools are, what's the capacity, what are the schools projected to uh, be with regards to membership and capacity, uh, what are some other um, uh, potential solutions that we have identified uh, if there's a capacity um, uh, or de deficit or even a capacity um, relief that we need to provide um, at the school. Um, so um, this changes every year. We may we evaluate this every year, so this may change every year. And um, uh, it's part of our annual CIP process. So we um, that's how we um, track the um, impacts on schools uh, from any proposed developments. And I would just add um, uh, one of the highlights of the um, presentation today and one of the, the changes that we're looking at for our uh, draft plan is to include um, include guidance that would um, commit staff, uh, county staff and school staff to do an assessment of school capacity and the effectiveness of the mitigations when we reach 50% of the development potential. So that is in addition to the reviews that are done by schools as development applications come in to implement the plan. So um, as property owners come in, um, with proposals under the new plan, the schools schools information will be assessed, as well as the annual reviews that schools does uh, through their capital improvement programming work. Um, and then, in addition to that, um, the the plan will um, will basically require a, a look, kind of a look back um, at at whatever point, um, if we get to the fifty percent of the development potential as well. Thank you. Thank you both. We have a couple comments from Partha. Uh, she said it's impressive that the task force has been working for over two years. We need to keep in mind, however, that almost a year of that was during a pandemic and can't be considered as normal participation. And that she's concerned uh, there wasn't as much solicitation from adjoining uh, neighborhood citizens 
to, to participate. So if someone can maybe speak to the outreach that was done, especially um, in light of the pandemic. Sure, we had, um, we had about a, a three month gap in meetings altogether from, I think we had a meeting in early March and then our next meeting was in late June of 2020. And that was, um, you know, a lot of time for, for the county to, um, to be able to host meeting with, meetings like this uh, virtually. So, um, so when we started meeting again in June, um, those meetings um, you know, were advertised and, and open to the public as well with um, opportunity um, opportunities for the public to participate in those meetings. Um, we had a, we also had a, a as Jen mentioned and Supervisor Frost mentioned, a, a community meet, a larger community meeting held virtually in November, um, where for that meeting we notified all the property owners in the CBC as well as the adjacent um, property owners adjacent to the CBC within a certain buffer area. And um, and you know continue continue our outreach efforts um, on social media, press releases, that sort of thing. So we, um, you know, we, we've made an effort to do um, to um, involve the community and and reach folks during this sort of unique time. Um, and so um, I appreciate the comment and um, and uh, you know we're as we continue to to hold meetings this way, I think we're um, we appreciate folks' participation in this kind of unique situation that we have. <clears throat> yeah, and, I, and I'd like to add, uh, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. I did it uh, as a community activist, uh, president of the McLean Citizen Association, uh, as a supervisor. Literally, this this process has an element of transparency and community involvement that typically, you know, we just don't have, and that was that visioning process. Uh, the outreach on that was fantastic. The participation was excellent. Uh, the you know everybody uh, got an opportunity to sit at a table and uh, express their opinions. Uh, and so, and subsequently, you know, admittedly there has been a, a pandemic, but we have not been uh, we have not had a very difficult time in terms of conducting public meetings. Uh, I. Literally, more people participate uh, than would typically show up at a uh, 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 an in-person meeting. In my experience, if we time these um, uh, virtual meetings properly, and I think you know this, for example, a Saturday morning is excellent. We normally don't do that, uh, so I, yeah, it's my job, and I admit it's my job to make sure that the community has an opportunity to express its opinion with respect to things of this nature. And I really feel like we've done our job on this one. Uh, I think that there's been a tremendous uh, 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 opportunity uh, and, and it's it's been an ongoing opportunity too. We've been talking about downtown McLean for a long time, uh, and really the, the essence of the conversation hasn't changed much in my experience, uh, but it's certainly come to a head now and we're at a, a place where I think we can move on to the next level. So anyway, uh, I, I really feel sorry if someone feels that they did not have an opportunity to participate, but I honestly believe that you know it, we, we tried and uh, it, it could have uh, you know, hopefully Hopefully, most people feel that they've been uh, had an opportunity to, to express their opinion, and the, and the process continues. Uh, you know, we're going to be here for the next month and a half or so before we have a very uh, you know, have a public hearing for the planning commission where everyone's encouraged to speak, and uh, then again uh, another public hearing before the board of supervisors where everyone will be encouraged to speak. So. Uh, and if there are other suggestions for improving our transparency, I'm more than welcome to entertain them. Great, thank you, Supervisor Faust. Uh, the next question comes from David. Uh, he asks, uh, he says that Supervisor Faust mentioned including uh, ADU and WDU bonuses in the stated heights. Uh, however, the presentation didn't seem to be describing the zones that way. Is staff including ADUs and WDUs in the density limits? 
Yes, yes, I think um, um, that those are the points, some of the points that were highlighted um, in in showing the new height, the heights and feet, um, the building heights that, that we described would be inclusive of those bonus intensities, um, which I think Jen mentioned, um, and the development potential cap that we've described would also be inclusive of any bonuses. So the number of units planned um, for the CBC would include the bonuses and the heights would include the bonuses. So that, um, you know, we, we received lots of comments about um, folks wanting to understand kind of what those maximums would be. So, um, so by, by adding that extra description um, and, and make, I think that make, helps to make it more clear that the heights um, would include any bonus. So there, there wouldn't be an expectation that there would be additional height coming from those units, similarly to the development cap. Thank you, Lana. This next question has to do with heights as well and, and with the guidelines for the park. Um, this comes from Chris. He says, what are the guidelines for the orientation slash configuration of the signature park to effectively benefit from direct sunlight, especially if there's a 128 foot high structure that joins it? Hi, this is Elizabeth Haig with DPD. Um, if this is a great question and we could certainly work in some additional language. I don't think we, we have that particular um, guidance right now in the plan. We, we could do that. The other opportunity is uh, following the adoption of this comprehensive plan amendment. There will be the commencement of district urban design guidelines where we can also get more into some of the details, certainly about the signature park and other public realm spaces. So I think it's a it's a good point and one that um, we do want to be cognizant of. So thank you for your comment. Yeah, this is Joe Gorney from DPD. I would also mention that during the redevelopment process, the rezoning process, um, most applicants will submit a shadow study um, so the park authority looks very closely at that planning staff looks very closely at that during that redevelopment process and and we can see what makes sense. Does it make sense with this building, how you orient the park spaces, the plantings. So that's all considered during the rezoning process as well. Thanks, Joe. And we have a, a question from Lewis. Uh, he said, it looks like we skipped a slide on central zone plaza. I'm not sure if this is the one that we're on right now. Um, it looked like a key slide uh, when it briefed up. Uh, there it is. Uh, so if we could revisit that and if somebody has anything to say about that slide. I think it was the one, um, the forward one at, where we talked about the consolidation, the change that we no longer have a minimum consolidation. You go forward a slide, David. Please. Maybe it, maybe it was before this. Sorry. The plan. Um, the, the slide. If you could just put up a zone map, I can explain. Um, the the. Um, could you go to a zone map? So the um, this we have the organization of the CBC would be in the, into these three zones, um, and we have a smaller bonus height area within the center zone within that area one project could come in um, and take advantage of additional height as an incentive to provide the public amenity the central open space that was identified as a as a community priority um, our current draft language for the comprehensive plan recommends that we have a between four and six acre consolidation for that area um, and in in reviewing this further, um, we we are proposing to remove that that minimum of four acres to provide additional flexibility for um, a development proposal to come forward. You know, if 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 a three acre consolidation works and the park can be provided, um, you know, uh, that would be great. Um, so we didn't want to. Um, we decided we didn't want to include the minimum. Um, however, we are maintaining the maximum of six acres for that consolidation and that um, is brought forward from the vision plan as well um, to reinforce that this is one smaller area within the center zone that could come in for that project. So that slide um, highlighted that highlighted the removal of the minimum consolidation recommendation in the current draft. 
but kept the maximum of six acres. Thank you, Leanna. And just as a reminder, these slides will be posted online um, on, on the study page, so you can refer to these later as well. I'm going to go to a couple questions on transportation. Um, the first one comes from Catherine. She says, if sidewalks are to be shared by pedestrians and bicyclists, what will be done to keep the two apart? Experience shows that bicyclists cannot safely mix on sidewalks with pedestrians. All right, so I, I guess just a, a general for background, in Fairfax County, it's legal for cyclists to bike on sidewalks, though they're really designed for pedestrians. Um, so in practice, um, it really comes down to user choice, um, you know, whether users, uh, whether cyclists are more comfortable on sidewalks versus in the road. I think less confident cyclists, especially children, sometimes will choose to ride on a sidewalk, uh, even when it is safe to ride in the road. Um, so that's that's just kind of a disclaimer. But um, really, the for this plan, um, we've suggested shared use paths and the uh, Old Dominion pedestrian bike pathway, which are somewhat uh, somewhat shared facilities, uh, intended to be shared facilities between pedestrians and cyclists. Um, the shared use paths um, are hopefully a facility that a lot of people are familiar with. There are a lot of them in the region. Those, you know, cyclists, pedestrians, you know, rollerbladers, uh, scooters, uh, increasingly, increasingly these days, uh, are expected to use those, can travel in either direction, and it really comes down to um, users being being courteous, traveling at a reasonable speed, speed yielding, uh, and, you know, I, we're not going to deny that there sometimes uh, can be stressful moments on those trails. Um, they are, in general, uh, very safe facilities. Um, and I would say getting safer um, with newer new design standards. Um, so that's the shared use path for the old Dominion facility. That is uh, even uh, enhanced separation from the standard standard shared use path. Um, hopefully, you saw on the on the streetscape graphic. Uh, we're envisioning a two foot buffer in between the pedestrian zone and the bike zone, as well as signage to, uh, to remind people. Um, so that, that, separation, um, that separation should help make people feel more comfortable and, and is kind of in addition to what you would expect on a standard shared use path um, in the region. So hopefully that answers the question. Um. I would just add that we're going to have signage as well. So this is a this was a little bit of a, a balancing act so that we balanced the amount of right of way and also maintained a more uh, urban condition that didn't have sort of a suburban bike trail going through the center of a downtown. So this this was kind of a hybrid, but we think between the the, the center lane marking and the signage that that this will um, this will work and then as it leaves the CBC it'll transition to the more suburban format but this this allows for um, a nicer um, urban core feel in in downtown McLean CBC. Great, thank you both. And and there was a similar question from Derek um, about Old Dominion in, in particular. I think Zach spoke well to that, um, asking about higher speed bicycle traffic remaining in vehicle lanes, if that would still be a thing. And I think it probably would be. I mean, if you, you can go to Fairfax County Parkway and, and see the trail there, there's still cyclists that, that ride on the parkway. So the faster cyclists um, oftentimes will remain on the road and, and be separated even further from the pedestrian traffic. Okay, uh, next question is also traffic related. Uh, has the county or task force done any assessment 
of the traffic impact to existing cut through neighborhoods that feed into and from the CBC. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, Bob Pecora with uh, Fairfax County DOT. In the transportation analysis that we did for the, uh, for the CBC area, uh, our model looked at the areas around the CBC that fed into uh, the downtown McLean area. And we looked at uh, those neighborhoods as part of the overall model that uh, forecast the traffic out to the year 2045. And the, uh, the comment here about if there's any like uh, cut through traffic or something, if your neighborhood is experiencing cut through traffic, there's a program within Fairfax County that's called Residential Traffic Administration Program where our staff can go out there and measure the traffic and see, um, determine uh, if you're experiencing cut through traffic today and you would like some kind of mitigation. So there's a program already in place for that. And uh, the first step in that is actually to contact your supervisor, Supervisor Faust's office, and they can initiate uh, that kind of a study. But uh, in general, Yes, we looked at not just the CBC uh, in the uh, in the gray area here on this map, but we looked at the region around it as part of the model, and we were able to forecast traffic out for about a 25 year period. And um, and uh, VDOT did re review the uh, traffic impact study, and they did approve that last summer for us. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Bob. Uh, this next question comes from April. Uh, assuming the plans discussed today are approved for the Board of Supervisors, when would redevelopment start? Redevelopment um, is based on um, development proposals coming forward from property owners. So the timing is unknown. Um, the plan, this plan is providing guidance for the future, uh, the future land use of the McLean CBC. But we don't have an estimated time frame for implementation. That will depend on um, on property owners coming forward with development proposals to implement the plan. Um, that would be through the rezoning process, where um, a, a proposal would come forward for um, for a project that would be reviewed by uh, county staff, the community, and then public hearings are held for uh, those proposals before both the planning commission and the board of supervisors. So that's um, so, so to answer your question, the timing is unknown, but that's a little bit um, more about the process of implementation. Thank you, Anna. Uh, the next question is on street uh, streetscapes. Excuse me. This comes from Chris. Prior to redevelopment, will the streetscape avenues and local roads have a design effort to furnish guidelines regarding materials? furnishings, lighting, tree species, and dimensioning guidelines that the community will have an opportunity to review? Another great question, Chris. Um, absolutely. So as I mentioned, after the uh, comprehensive plan amendment is adopted by the board, we will be forming some kind of community group to assist us in developing these kinds of guidelines so that we will get into the particulars on the streetscape. What is the paving material? What are the furnishings? What do they look like? Tree species, all of that. So absolutely, that's the that's the next level that we, we delve into those types of details. Thank you, Liz. Uh, we have one more on traffic. Uh, this, this could use some clarification. This is from Anna Marie. How can the addition of some 3,000 plus residential units and commercial buildings not increase traffic? Uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, Bob McCore again. Uh, the, the traffic study did, uh, we analyzed the additional residential units and the non-residential uh, density and traffic will increase in the uh, in the CBC area, but in our study and uh, the mitigations that we're proposing or any kind of road improvements that would happen over time as development occurs, uh, the, the road network that's in the CBC can still uh, function uh, to handle the traffic that is uh, that would come with with redevelopment or 
with uh, new changes or uh, zoning cases that come in. So the existing road network is uh, already in place. There wasn't really anything where we needed to add more roads or add lanes. Uh, the only thing that we looked at uh, as far as mitigations was looking at where there are stop controls uh, or stop signs basically where signals might be needed in the future. And that, that comes with as more traffic is uh, coming on the roads or is found on the roads and uh, a signal may be the, the best bet for uh, to replace a stop sign. And there were three intersections that we saw that came into, into that uh, into that realm that would need something like that in the future. But, but as, as it is today, there, there are uh, some traffic concerns. Uh, we've heard that from the neighborhood, uh, from the community. And uh, there are other studies in the area that are happening that we'll be looking at uh, doing shorter, uh, near term, sorry, near term improvements to the traffic around McLean CDC uh, that might alleviate traffic because of the concerns that are happening today. And there will be a, uh, I believe, a public meeting sometime this spring for uh, discussions about Dolly Madison Road. That, that meeting has not been scheduled yet, but there, uh, our staff, uh, DOT staff, is looking at some mitigation options on Dolly Madison and uh, Great Fall Street. So that will be presented to the uh, community sometime this spring. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Bob. Uh, next question is from Sonali. She says, can you review again the height limits around Franklin Sherman? And does this apply to the buildings across Corner Lane and the Baptist Church lot? Sure. So um, one of the um, some of the comments we've received um, expressed concern about the height that could be uh, possible in the general zone, the five story, and now we have a new um, maximum height and feet. Um, this area shown here in blue is part of land unit G2. Um, so the general zone is an area identified for redevelopment and we've heard um, concerns about height adjacent to the school. The existing zoning districts here are commercial zoning districts that would allow for up to a 40 foot height by right if, uh, you know, if a property owner um, wanted to pursue that now um, in, in any of these zoning districts, uh, you could go up to 40 feet. So what we're considering is, um, is having um, additional height guidance to um, to limit that height in this area. Um, this, this graphic highlights the area um, just to the west of the school. Um, we have heard additional feedback um, since, since drawing this graphic here about, um, about extending that limitation to, um, to the area to the south there. Um, so um, I appreciate the comment um, and, and that's something that we're continuing to, um, to talk about. Great, thank you, Anna. I do see somebody on the phone has their hand raised, so I'm going to go to them. This is a 703-821 number. I'm going to unmute your microphone now and you can ask your question. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yep, we hear you. I am April Georgelis, and I have some comments and questions reflecting input from residents. Supervisor Faust claims in his notices that the CBC is community-driven planning. No, it is not, not yet. The Faust-appointed task force is rushing to CBC County approval, bypassing the majority of our McLean community. A few hundred people participating with Street Sense several years ago and in a Q&A does not equal 60,000 uninformed residents. A postcard in November to homeowners within 300 feet of a CBC edge zone is not adequate. An aggressive PR plan from Supervisor Faust in the county is essential for community awareness. They did this for bus riders, they can do it for us. Many detailed community information Information meetings are essential for community understanding, input, and wise CBC decision making. Supervisor Files should not yet promote the CBC planning to a higher level. These detailed meetings must occur before a rushed April 28th Planning Commission hearing. The hearing is too late for real community input and will signal a rushed, done deal to the community. No study support data for viability and sustainability was presented then with Street Sense. They thought it was viable. And more, none is presented now with the greatly expanded, taller, denser plan. 
I asked for cost for builder cost analysis to support the expanded taller, denser task force and county planning. Nothing is forthcoming. A two-third acre park open sp space area is not guaranteed in this plan. This is a key demand. The six-acre contingency with 10 stories must be con reconsidered and evaluated with study cost data. I asked for a VIA, visual impact assessment, and elevations to help residents understand full impacts of current plans on the homeowners near and in CBC and businesses. None are forthcoming. They would show real impacts on homes and businesses, and as one task force member cautioned, might alarm the community. I asked for CBC landowner color coding and identifying major CBC landowners. The community needs to understand who owns the McLean CBC and where. Oral questions presented in gatherings must be posted with text online with detailed answers for public review. December 14, 2021 was the last task force meeting. Resident observers were allowed questions after each task force meeting and not during discussions. I asked four questions and sections on the record and asked for answers on the record. None have been responded to or posted on the CBC site. I comment I commented again about the lack of public no notification of the task force meeting. Supervisor Faust failed to mention it in his notice. Kim, the chair, once again said blame is that we do not have a local radio station and newspaper. Really, there are many ways to communicate, including daily McLean Patch and Tyson's reporter info shares. I asked for full disclosure. Number one, I asked if task force members were aware of any projects waiting in the wings for after BOS approval of CBC plan, where, which landowners, developers, what is project. An example would be Bob Montgomery, a task force member and prominent CBC landowner. What are your plans for the CBC, I asked. Where, when? There was not an answer from Bob at that meeting. Bob has apparently since come forth to MPC and county with one-story plans to rebuild near Giant and the Verizon area with a new Giant. It is by right. Will this go forward? No one knows. What are his plans for his other major CBC sites? No answers yet. However, apparently one story will not deter a developer from proposing buildings, contrary to what the task force and county are reporting. Why are so much higher heights necessary in three zones? Where are the data and cost analysis? Number two, I asked that evening for a full disclosure of affiliations for Faust's appointed task force members to the CBC landowners, developers, and builders associated with the CBC. Have they worked for, consulted with, are working for, will be working for CBC landowners and developers? Which ones? What CBC site? Please listen also to um, number three in the in the meeting. It's hey, all April, up. sorry. I, I'm I almost to... finished. I'm almost finished. You spent more on the bicycles and pedestrians. Request for study data to support the current expanded plan. Uh, shared community awareness such as form versus far. Task force members took nine months of debate to understand it with a 50-50 vote and form in the center area because Commissioner Allfelder stepped in, cast the deciding vote for form in center area zone. Is this allowed? Really? Apparently, bypassing the community does not include public transparency and proper public process. This must be changed for wise CBC planning and redesign. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, April. Uh, just a quick reminder to everyone, we do have quite a few questions and then people that want to participate. So please try to limit your questions to a couple of minutes. Um, do we have anybody that can respond to, to April? I'll, I'll simply say that, you know, you, I just don't agree with her I, in so at so many levels. And this is not unusual, uh, as April knows. Uh, this was a very transparent uh, process. Uh, the fact that uh, you know, I, how she could question the affiliation of the members of the uh, task force. She knows them. They're our neighbors. They're, you know, we're almost without exception. They're the people who uh, have been working on behalf of this community for you know, years. And so, you know, it, you, anybody can, can suggest sinister motives, uh, you know, the types of uh, uh, 
uh, suggestions that are being made here, but that, that's not what's happening. This this was a this is a community driven process that has addressed most of the issues that were just discussed, either by not uh, uh, they're not part of the plan or they you know have been discussed and, and decisions have been made by a vast majority of the task force. So uh, you know I, I I respect everyone's opinion, but I don't agree with everyone's opinion. And I don't agree with uh, most of what April just said. And I, I think we have a very, we should be proud of the community effort that we've uh, just uh, gone through. And we should be grateful to the people who stepped up to do it on our behalf. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Faust. I have uh, one more question. It looks like from the phone and I'll go back to written responses. Uh, this is from Carl. Uh, Carl, I'm going to unmute your microphone and you can ask your question. Oh, wow. Okay. Gee, I, I didn't think my hand was raised. Uh, that's great. Um, uh, Supervisor Faust, I, I have to agree with much of what April said. Uh, I mean, I, I just became aware of this issue two years ago. I think a lot of my neighbors are only now tuning into it. I, I would hate to think that this is a faith accompli when uh, I live on the edge of the CDC. I think a lot of people are just waking up to the changes this would make in our community. And and my main my main concern are with the traffic. Traffic is already snarled. Whenever traffic is diverted from 495, there are major delays at the intersection of Burke and Old Dominion, and sometimes Kirby and uh, Linway Terrace. And I'm thinking that 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 six to eight thousand additional residents will only worsen the problem. And then the schools. The schools are already overcrowded. Uh, McLean High is overcrowded, Longfellow is overcrowded, and there's no money to solve the problem. The redistricting has left McLean High School overcrowded. So how will a study, uh, you know, when 50% when of these new developments have been built, bringing three to 4,000 new residents, how will a study help ease the overcrowding when we already don't have the money to solve the problem? Uh, and I'm worried my kids are going to be attending. Uh, my, well, I have a son at Franklin Sherman. And he's going to be attending Longfellow and McLean, and my daughter will be attending Franklin Sherman next year. So I'm very concerned about the overcrowding. I'm very concerned about the traffic. Uh, and I'm also concerned, of course, about the, the land bordering Franklin Sherman. I think there should be a moratorium on development there. I don't want high rise development bordering the school for obvious reasons. There's a safety problem. Uh, you know, we have obviously there, I'm not going to discuss what the actual problems are, but use your imagination. I think there should be a moratorium on development around the school for the safety of our of our young students. Um, so there you go. I'd love to hear your views on uh, school overcrowding and how a study without any money backing it up would help. Uh, and also the the traffic. The traffic is already bad. Again, if traffic's diverted from 495, and the additional traffic is just going to make my commute to DC hell. And it's been great so far, but I, I don't want it to, to, to deteriorate. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, as far as the moratorium on development around uh, Franklin Sherman, I mean, legally, that is not something that is uh, possible to uh, do. Uh, there are by right uh, zoning, uh, they have the right to do certain development by right. Uh, it, it would be a taking uh, by the county to deny them that right. Uh, and that by right development, and this goes back many, many years, and I'm not even sure how far back, but way before probably most of our times, that property was zoned in a way that they can build uh, up to uh, 40 foot tall buildings without asking permission. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that's come out of the discussion, uh, and, and it's a great uh, it's a great result, I think, of the discussion we're having is that, you know, uh, we don't have to, while we have to let them build up to 40 feet, we don't have to allow them to build any more than 40 feet. And so, as I understand the way the, uh, the plan will be drafted at this point, we're going to limit them to the height that they're currently uh, entitled to. So, uh, and, and that should be, I mean, it's, uh, it's not going to uh, overwhelm, uh, it's not gonna be so tall it would uh, uh, overwhelm the school by any stretch of the imagination. 
Uh, and then, uh, you know, we will study this uh, constantly. Every, every rezoning is studied. Uh, but what we're uh, it, to look at whether there are significant issues with infrastructure that maybe uh, justify not approving a, a land use case and saying, no, we can't allow you to rezone. Uh, you can build by right, but you can't uh, have the densities you're asking for, or maybe the process of the rezoning effort is that uh, they're asked to reduce uh, their uh, what they're asking for in order to uh, uh, not get out ahead of the infrastructure. Uh, and, and then you, there's just the the process of you know, we're going. We're going to constantly, and it will be other people, I'm sure, uh, because it's not going to happen overnight. But you, you know, as, as this is going to be a very incremental thing, this is not going to, you know, McLean's not going to change dramatically as quickly as some might like, or quicker than others might like. Uh, it's going to be a slow evolutionary process, and it will be an opportunity to keep up with infrastructure. That's that's the, the whole um, the whole point, practically, uh, I would say, of planning is to make sure that you you can serve the development with the infrastructure that you either have or that you commit to delivering. So uh, now your 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 concerns are very legitimate, uh, but I think we're okay. I mean, I I, I think that the uh, there's nothing more we can do about Franklin Sherman than what we're going to do. And uh, we will uh, work really hard as, uh, to make sure that the uh, infrastructure is um, accommodates what is happening in downtown McLean. Thank you, Supervisor Faust. Uh, next question is about public parking. This comes from Jim. It says, what provision will be made for public parking adjacent to the signature park so that residents of surrounding neighborhoods might be better able to enjoy its benefits. So that is something that will be looked at as part of the rezoning for the incentive development project. Again, this is up to six acres. And as we review the park, um, undoubtedly they will have some form of structured parking, uh, perhaps underground parking, and we'll look at the need for um, parking for the, the park itself, as well as the land uses during the zoning case. Thank you, Liz. Uh, we have another question from Sonali. She asks if we can review again the planned additional residential units. Street sense proposed about 900 plus, which was generally agreed upon. It seems the 1600 plus additional units are significantly above this level. Sure. The, um, so we have in the adopted plan today, um, we have a residential development potential of about 2175 units. Um, the vision plan um, informed, informed the uh, development of this. Um, by providing a 10 year demand um, for residential and non residential uses. Um, and then, um, and then the task force and staff also reviewed. Um, we had a, a submission period that um, that was held during the process uh, where we heard from um, from some property owners about interest in, in redevelopment. They weren't they weren't specific zoning proposals, but we did use that um, that. Those proposed development potentials to um, to help inform this proposed new development potential by adding that to the vision plan um, to grow the the potential beyond the 10 year demand. Um, the comp plan looks further out than 10 years, um, so we use that development potential uh, to 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 look beyond the 10 years um, to get closer to the 20 years. Um, and then there were there was some additional potential um, informed by the vision plan in terms of some of their mappings that were were tested for uh, public facility impacts. Um, so that's how we got to, we start with the adopted plan potential, um, use the 10 year demand, and then um, and we were informed by the submissions that came in 
um, and evaluated that additional development potential. Um, and so the proposed plan um, has the 3850 for the entire CDC, which is what you see here. There's no plan change um, for the edge zone. Um, this new development potential is, would be uh, limited to the center and, and general zones. Thank you, Lena. I'm going to go to another question. Um, schools regarding the school yield study at 50% of development potential. Did that result in the county assigning a lower yield for McLean than the county at large? Would that make it easier to approve new residential in McLean? Um, I can take this one. So um, I think one of the thoughts that we um, did discuss is um, we have identified the need for an assessment at 50%, but from a school's perspective, we would be assessing um, any upcoming developments within a five-year time frame every year. So that's part of our projections review. Um, as information becomes available or rezoning applications come in, um, we review those applications or we review developments um, and impacts from those developments for every application. So um, with our um, capital improvement program um, annual review and our projections annual review, we would be assessing developments um, and impacts on developments every year. Um, having said that, if there's a need uh, prior to um, reaching the 50% mark, if FCPS um, needs to assess any additional development impacts, uh, we would be considering that. Great, thank you, Pranita. We have another question on heights. This is from Linda. You noted that the heights stated are inclusive of WDU and ADU and bonus density development. Um, development is also limited by a 3.0 FAR as discussed at the right size McLean Coalition meeting with Elwood County staff. Is a 3.0 FAR inclusive of these bonus densities? So as, as proposals come um, forward for implementation, they would come forward under a planned zoning district, a P district, which in McLean has a 3.0 FAR limit. Um, the, the zoning ordinance um, does allow for additional intensity associated um, with that affordable and workforce housing um, for that 3.0. Um, we are proposing to limit the, um, the, the building heights um, in the, as we've discussed in the comp plan, we're proposing to limit the building heights and our development potential um, to be inclusive of those bonuses. Thank you, Leanna. This next question is from Stuart on surface parking. Uh, he said that in the presentation, um, it was noted the importance of surface parking to support retail, but in the current plan lines 148 through 150, the principles say that parking may include surface but structured and underground parking is preferred uh, which is it is it surface or underground preference uh, so it, it depends on the zone in the center zone we see to accommodate the heights and and the intensities probably you'll have more structure parking however we recognize for retail to be successful you often need what we call teaser parking, a little bit of surface parking, perhaps in the front or to the side. Um, and, and residential uses, we know you need uh, places for pickup and drop off. So um, I think what we're envisioning is that as you go to the general zone, it's gonna be more of a suburban urban hybrid that you'll, that's the place where we'll retain the convenient, uh, retail uses that that may still have more surface parking uh, either in front or to the side but in the center zone it'll take a more urban form so it's it, the overall cbc will will have a combination and we we certainly want any retail that we have to be successful so they'll they'll all be looked at on a, a case by case basis as zoning applications come in thank you Liz. Uh, next question is from Lewis. Uh, he asks, how can the plan protect McLean from a worst case scenario that allows increased density, but never delivers the central plaza that Supervisor Faust correctly said was the trade-off 
that was key to community support. Well, I, I guess I'll take a stab at this. So we're hoping that, and that was part of the street sense assessment that it would be financially viable with uh, with the amount of density that we're providing for the incentive bonus area to provide at least a two third acre park. So there's some some market reality behind that. Obviously, there's going to need to be some consolidation that would allow for you know a, a sizable development to occur. Um, and we're we're hoping that this provides enough incentive. I will mention separate from this comprehensive plan amendment is a new county program called the economic incentive program that offers uh, financial incentives for consolidation and the McLean CBC is an eligible area. So I think once the plan gets approved, we would certainly promote that program um, as a mechanism along with the the extra bonus height and development in the incentive zone to encourage that to happen. Short of that, we may have to look at um, you know more more public sector involvement to to try and create a park if over you know a number of years um, we're, we're not successful in achieving this park. Because we know it's it is this the centrally most important thing to the McLean community. Thank you. Uh, and I would say, uh, you know, while they can get uh, the additional height uh, with if they provide the two thirds of an acre, uh, and they have the consolidation, that doesn't mean that we won't be looking at every application that comes in to see how we can contribute toward. Uh, getting uh, a central uh, park facility. I, I think two thirds is the minimum. I think we need to try to get more. If, if you're familiar with the Signet, uh, the developer there was just awesome. Uh, you know, working with them, they got they got what they wanted in terms of the, uh, the, the additional density, uh, but turned around and uh, provided a really nice, uh, Park smaller than what we want for the central business district, but it was a lot less land involved than what we're talking about in the central business district. So it's, you know, I just feel that this is eminently doable. Uh, this is probably, yeah, this will happen. Uh, and it will, if it's uh, on, on a six acre parcel, I mean, it, it's almost impossible to cover three acres with buildings if you go to these types of heights. Uh, there is going to be land uh, available to do this, and uh, it's uh, it, it's going to be a goal of every every application that comes in. We'll be looking for contributions to this type of thing. Thank you, Supervisor Faust. Uh, next question is from Chris. Can you describe the associated setback requirements that will be required for the center section, where building heights are significant, particularly as it relates to a fairly narrow local road? Can we can we go to the uh, the streetscape diagram? What we're proposing throughout the uh, the center zone and general zone is um, let's, let's go to the yeah the the streetscape components. So what you see here, um, moving in from the curb and gutter, you'll have a landscape panel for your street trees, street lights. Um, then we'll have the walkway or cycle track in this case, or the shared bicycle um, walkway. And then what you're seeing is um, a minimum, it says four to 12 foot building zone. We're, we're, we're asking for at least a minimum of four feet, depending on what use goes there. Let's say it's a, a restaurant and they want to have an outdoor cafe. So th that could be larger. It could go to 12 feet to allow for outdoor seating, uh, tables and chairs, or perhaps they, it, it, even if it's not a dining area, it could just be um, a, an urban 
park component, um, a, a place for for seating. So that's the the general um, dimensions that we're looking for. Hope that answers it. Thank you, Liz. Let's see, uh, we're running um, up on time here. I'll take a few more questions and then um, we'll have Supervisor Faust for some closing remarks. Uh, the next question, uh, this comes from Elizabeth. If the height limit does not include architectural features and utility features above the stories of the building, will there be a limit on the height above the stories for those architectural and utility features? If so, what would that limit be? So under the zoning ordinance, things like mechanical equipment and that sort of thing um, typically is not included in the height calculation. However, we've put in some plan language that uh, we do cap it at, um, what is it, 20 feet? It, or 20, 25. It's 25%. 25. 25. 20, 25% or 20 feet. That's it, 25%. Whichever is less, so the when you when you do the math, whichever number is less, that's what. Yeah, so twenty feet um, probably be your worst case, and this this is true of all buildings. Your your existing high rise, your Ashby, and McLean House, um, all their building heights are not inclusive of any mechanicals, elevator shaft, that sort of thing. So that is. Uh, standard operating procedure um, with county zoning and buildings. Thank you, Liz. Next question is from Kevin. With the increase of new buildings, construction, and residents, please address what you will do for vehicular parking so it doesn't spill over to the edge in residential areas. Um, I could, I can take a, a start on this for the parking. Uh, and it not spilling over into local streets with the, uh, any development, uh, there are certain zoning restrictions or zoning guidelines or recommendations that all the parking has to be met on site. Uh, so whether it's surface or, uh, it's in a structure or below grade, all the parking would have to be met on site. If, uh, the, uh, the adjacent roads, there are public roads, so the parking is allowed unless there is a residential parking permit district in place that limits parking there. Um, if it's a private neighborhood, um, I believe McLean Mews is a private neighborhood, you can't really park on, on those streets because it is a private neighborhood. So uh, there are areas where you can uh, do public parking on, let's say, Beverly and Elm Street, but uh, Old Dominion and Chambridge Road. Uh, there's limited areas for parking. I believe only Old Dominion has parking south of um, of Chambridge Road. I think there's maybe four or five spaces that are clearly marked for parking right now. But the major road like Old Dominion and Chambridge Road do not have on street parking. And uh, but uh, the smaller roads like Beverly and Elm and other local streets like Ingleside, you can still park on those roads because there is space for uh, uh, designated parking there. Um, that's, that's all I have for, at least for that start. Okay, thank you, Bob. Uh, next, um, we've talked about this a little bit already, but this is from Kathleen. Uh, because G2 abuts uh, residential area, the area needs to have a buffer, such as an edge zone rather than just the area immediately next to the school. The schoolyard is currently planned to be surrounded by a 68 foot wall. What will reduce shadowing and light in this case? Um, we're looking, can you, can you repeat the part you said about the wall, Tim? I'm sorry, I can't see this chat question over here. Um, Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll reread the question. Uh, because G2 abuts residential area, the area needs to have a buffer such as an edge zone rather than the area just immediately next to the school. So the schoolyard currently is planned to be surrounded by a 68-foot wall. What, were, what will reduce shadowing and light? 
we're looking at um, one of the changes that we're considering for the plan is to limit the height um, in this area surrounding the school um, to the to the west of the school. And I know we've um, in this meeting and previously received comments about um, limiting the height to the area to the south as well to 40 feet uh, to reflect the existing height to, um, to help to address that concern. That would limit the, the general zone can go up to the five stories and the limit that we've shown now for, for the 68 feet. And so um, we're, we're considering additional language that would limit that further to the 40 feet. Thank you, Lena. Uh, I see one from Ben. Uh, he says, if general is not a focus for redevelopment, but also hosts older shopping centers with vacancies and lack of screening to residents behind them. How does the plan address improving in kind across parcels, um, i.e., the McLean Shopping Center? So that's why there, there is there is some redevelopment encouraged in the general zone to hopefully. Um, create some of the new style development that people are looking for. Um, if, if there are particular concerns about existing conditions that that may be addressed through enforcement of the zoning code, it depends on you know, what are the particulars that the, the questioner is um, hinting at. So um, I don't know, Deanna, you wanna add to this or? No, I think um, the plan sets up expectations for redevelopment opportunities. So um, if the question is about um, existing development, um, you know, improvements to facades or existing buildings um, wouldn't come forward with review under the comprehensive plan, but we are, um, there is guidance for that in the general zone um, for, for redevelopment. Okay, this next question is from Kathleen. How is the county going to mitigate the increase of noise on the surrounding townhouses and surrounding neighborhoods? Um, any any potential um, noise impacts would be reviewed during the development review process as well. If there um, if there was an expectation that there would be noise impacts, that would uh, you know. Um, Staff would take a look at um, any proposed uses against existing uses to identify if that would be an issue and, and work on mitigation as part of that process. Yeah, and this is Joe Gorney from DPD. I would also note that just the orientation of the uses and where they're located. Oftentimes, when you have these developments, you do have the buildings or parking garages or even fences uh, that provide a pretty good wall and a pretty good, they block very well the, the noise that might go from a particular use to another. And, and again, during the redevelopment process and that zoning review, um, that's something that is looked at very closely in terms of where are the uses located and how will they transition. So we emphasize to anybody who comes in that you are part of a community. How do you fit in? to this community? How are you improving it? How are you building as a piece of it? How do you fit in this puzzle? And, and, and that is absolutely one of the things that we look at is the proximity of uses and whether the building itself might block something, the light, the noise, the hours of operation, all of those things are looked at very closely during that rezoning process. Great, thank you, Joe. So we have uh, less than five minutes left in the meeting today. I'd like to invite Supervisor Faust uh, to have some closing remarks and then I'll, I'll wrap it up with some housekeeping items following that. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I pretty much said my piece in the opening, but uh, I will reiterate uh, that you know, we really appreciate your participation. Uh, you know, the, uh, I, there's, Still time to give us input. Uh, the uh, planning commission and uh, uh, board of supervisors hearings are typically in major parts of this uh, process. At this point, I mean, we've, we've really uh, had a, a, a really uh, vibrant or uh, good 
community outreach process. It's never perfect, and I apologize, and I'm sorry that some people are just supposedly learning of this. Uh, it's not unusual, but it's a little bit surprising given the fact that this has been around for two and a half years, uh, and you know the, the efforts that have been put in by those who support and oppose. I mean, I, I respect both sides, but uh, I, I am very proud uh, to represent this community uh, as this process has unfolded. It's been a very, very good process. Again, I want to thank the task force members uh, for giving up so much of their time uh, to help us get to this point. I'll reiterate that I did, they were not selected. Most of them were not selected by supervisor class. Most of them were selected by offering the community organizations uh, an opportunity to uh, uh, designate people who they felt would represent the interests of the, the, the interests that they represent in the community. So it's been a good process. Staff has been just outstanding to work with. We got some of the best uh, planning and zoning staff and transportation staff that uh, the county has to offer. And uh, I want to thank Ben Wiles, my my. Uh, Staff person who uh, has uh, been intimately involved in all this. So, anyway, continue to communicate with us, and uh, you know, uh, we look forward to uh, to moving this forward. And uh, I, I look forward to seeing a, a revitalized McLean that uh, has again something for everyone. And I truly believe that's what this plan has to offer. So, thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Supervisor Faust. Uh, so just as a reminder, recording of this meeting will be available on the McLean CDC webpage in the coming days. Uh, we got a lot of good questions today, some that went unanswered. So any that we didn't get to this morning will be responded to either directly to the participant um, or post on the study webpage. We will have a written Q&A document um, for those questions as well. Um, if you didn't get a chance to provide feedback, uh, like Supervisor Faust said, we would love for you to submit those questions and that feedback online to the email provided on the screen. As a reminder, the final recommended conference plan for the McLean CBC will be presented during a public hearing to the Planning Commission and the Board of Supervisors, and those dates are also um, displayed on the screen as well. And so if you want any more information on that, you can go to the website, fairfaxcounty.gov slash planning development slash McLean CBC study. So thank you all again. That concludes today's meeting. Um, thank you for your participation. Thank you.